This week, we are wrapping up the contents of Sword Art Online Volume 10 Elicization Running with the action-oriented high point of the book as well as the emotional high point. Can Kirito withstand the swordsman's pride as well as his ancestors? Can he fulfill the promise he made to Sortiliana Serlut? Well, if you're watching this video, I assume you already know the answer, since I'm here to go in depth on these scenes that the anime glossed over from time to time. Welcome everyone, and this is Sword Art Online Elicization Explained, featuring episode 8, Swordsman's Pride. As usual, timestamps for individual plot points are in the description as well as the pinned comment for you to navigate easily throughout the video. This episode, as mentioned, covered the final 30 or so pages of volume 10 Elicization running and was more or less quite faithful. Almost no cuts, minor anime original editions that are actually meaningful, it was quite the amazing episode this week. If you're a regular of my Elicization Explained series, you probably realized I'm only using screenshots and music from the Sonic the Hedgehog series, that's because of Sony Music Entertainment Japan striking down one of my videos, despite the copyright laws available in Europe and Austria, and I'm seriously getting tired of fighting back while well, having 4 of my 8 videos blocked at the moment, one having its dispute accepted, while two others are still within the dispute process, so congratulations Sony Music Entertainment Japan, you won, I give up. From now on, Explain series will continue with still screenshots and Sonic the Hedgehog music, because Sega are not legal dicks. Hope you understand the reasoning behind, but yeah, that's the case. I will also be having hashtag save your internet for the article 13 debacle, on the top right corner, you know, about the things in Europe, but still, they really pushed me to actually take part in this shitstorm by annoying me so much. Anyways, since I already spent so much time on this explanation, quickly, if you're new to the series, what I do here is compare the anime to the light novels, explain things where the anime glossed over, so you can get the full picture, talk about, you know, cut or dropped scenes, which there aren't any really in this episode, it was quite faithful and occasionally share some opinions here and there. Also, celebrating 20k subscribers, I am running a recurring giveaway. More or less each month, I'll be handing out to the winner of the giveaway one of the Elicization novels, but I'll talk more about that in a bit, so stay tuned. Without further ado, the episode starts right where the previous episode ended, Kirito and Volo Levantine on the arena. You can see Golgoroso Balto in the stands, who had so little to do in the novels as well that he doesn't even have a voice actor in the anime, and Humbert and Rios just being the usual dicks that they are. But here we get to hear straight from Liena about the source of Volo's power. His family mantra that provides an immense amount of confidence, making him believe that he is actually unbeatable. This dialogue here is pretty much a one-to-one -one adaptation of the novels, with Liana reminding Kirito of his promise, the key motivation keeping Kirito moving forward despite all the hurdles he was facing, as well as the ones he would face later in this episode. Obligatory mention that the title card still says beginning, I'm low-key expecting it to change next week to turning as the, you know, turning point of the series from a narrative standpoint as well. Please do believe in this as well, so maybe we can overwrite the systems of A1 to ensure it says turning next week, just stay with me. After the opening, both Kirito and Volo draw their swords. The crowd was quite amazed by Volo's sword, however, when Kirito drew his, they were astonished. They simply had never seen a sword coded in full black. Pretty much all the swords available for the public to see was either regular plain, you know, wooden training swords or the usual cool looking metallic swords. However, Kirito's titled the black one at the moment was covered in full black, absorbing the light, not reflecting it back as it was made from the Giga Cedar, the tree that had drained all the power, all the light provided by Solus to grow more and more powerful. The sword itself literally showcased the history of the demon tree here, and of course, Rios and Humbert being the resident dicks as usual. But as Volo assumed the position of the high Norkia style sword skill, Mountain Splitting Wave, based on what Kirito recognized as the Aincrad sword skill Avalanche, ready to come down with sheer power and power alone, Kirito had already created a counterattack in his mind. He planned to use Vertical Square, it was the highest ranking skill he knew he could use, as it was the 4 combo attack he managed to use successfully in the previous episode in the woods. He knew he could do it. The first 3 fast hits 
would be enough to block Volo's mountain splitting wave attack and the fourth combo would finish the duel. The first hit slowed Volo's sword down, second managing to almost bring it to a halt. Third hit did indeed stop the progress of the skill, but Kirito was shocked at the scene he found himself in. The motion had stopped, yes, but both skills were still going, trying to overcome each other in a standstill. But the reason for this resistance promptly showed itself to Kirito. Multiple other figures, the entire Levantine family pushing forward. It was not just the pride of a single swordsman, it was an entire family line. But Kirito had reasons to fight as well, his promise, his companion, his reality was waiting for him. And suddenly, his sword started glowing, extending its size by a tiny margin. Kirito was not aware of it entirely, but the memory of the sword was activated in this case. Miss Azurika hinted at this in the previous scenes which was omitted by the previous episode, but Kirito's The Black One was not an ordinary high tier sword. It was a divine object and it possessed a memory, a past if you will. It was the demon tree of Rulit standing tall against everything on the hill, draining the power of Terraria from the ground and the power of Solus from the light. Volo Levantine's sword was not the first obstacle it had faced and it would not be the last. Unaware of this new power assisting him, Kirito pushed forward, cancelling out the heavenly mountain splitting wave, knocking Volo back by a considerable margin. The fourth combo would end the duel, but Kirito knew it wouldn't connect. No matter what, he was limited by the range of the sword skill, or so he thought, and the most he could reach in the end was Volo's uniform. As both came to eye for one last time, Miss Azurika stopped them both, marking the end of the duel to avoid bloodshed. Kirito was confused as to why Volo suddenly obeyed her, but was promptly explained that she was the first to represent the Northern Empire in the Four Empire Unification Tournament where the winner was granted access to the Axiom Church Tower. The same goal Kirito and Yujo had on their path. And we can see Ryos and Humbert trying way too hard to find a way to be the resident dicks as usual. Also, Miss Azurika's look towards Kirito may actually signify we'll get more of her in the future and maybe we will actually get some more information about the quote unquote sword memory concept. But yeah, we're gonna have to wait for that. Also, as Liana scolded Kirito for not surrendering, Kirito's inner monologue was dropped here. He, he simply did not know that he had the option to surrender in a punishment duel. God damn it, Kirito, pay attention for once, will ya? The speech at Liana's celebration party, however, was a nice anime original scene. The party was mentioned in the novels, but had no context. It was just mentioned in passing, aside from how a certain elite disciple and trainee page had passed out. But this episode actually explained the past of the Serlut style Liana was using. It was skipped in the previous episode, though since I hoped it would be explained today, I had not mentioned it last week, and here we are, my gamble is paying off once again, to not spoil you too early, you're welcome. Compared to the Norkia style showcased proudly by many at the academy, Noble Blood, Sortiliana Serlut, used the Serlut style belonging to her family without any resentment, despite the fact that it was looked down upon by many due to their past. But Kirito's use of another out of the ordinary sword style without looking back really inspired Liana to do her best with her Serlut style. Later that night however when Kirito wanted to fulfill his promise to her with the final surprise, well... Humbert and Ryos were being the resident dicks as usual. I honestly love how great they are voiced and animated in the anime, it's just their dickish nature could not have been presented any better, I really want to punch the two in the face, but yeah, they had destroyed the Zephilia flowers, the third and final attempt of Kirito at growing them, so he could show what they looked like to Liana, who always wanted to see how Zephilia flowers looked when bloomed. Kirito was actually so angry in this case that if he had a sword with him that instant, he would rush to Humbert and Ryos and swing it at them, blatantly ignoring the rules of the academy, of the imperial law and the taboo index. But right now, all he could do was to look at the broken flowers. The shattering of the flower right in his hand is so heartbreaking as well and Yoshitsugu Matsuoka, Kirito's VA is doing an absolutely flawless job here as usual. Kirito tried to figure out how the dick duo did this 
You know, it was forbidden by the taboo index to harm the property of others. The garden belonged to the academy and the flowers were bought by Kirito. But only then did it dawn on Kirito. Objects like flowers had no ownership and their ownership was essentially assigned to whoever owned the land that they were being nurtured on. However, he had not purchased the dirt he put the flowers in. He had just dug it up from the outside city, from a field that belonged to no one. So by the logic of the taboo index, the flowers were nobody's property. Hence why Rios and Humbert never breached the taboo index here. And all Kirito could do now was to cry. But at his lowest moment, Kirito heard a voice. A voice so close to his mind that he thought was just his imagination. The reality, however, was that the voice was just really, really close to his mind, quite literally. The observer from the skipped Zakaria chapter had decided to intervene, ignoring the rules of its master. No, her master. She lived through everything with Kirito ever since he and Yujiro left from Rulid. They went through a lot of abuse on their journey, but this was too much for the observer to bear. She had to help. Have faith, said the voice. Believe in the strength of the flowers you grew so well in this foreign land. Believe in yourself for getting them to that point. Kirito had never heard the voice before. It certainly wasn't the voice he heard when he saw the vision of the golden-haired girl two years ago inside the End Mountains. This voice was incredibly calm, full of deep knowledge and had just the faintest hint of warmth. But they're all dead, Kirito muttered to himself. It's alright, responded the voice, as calm as before. The roots in the soil are doing their best to live. Can't you feel it? All the holy flowers blooming in this garden are trying to save their little companions. They want to share their life with them. And you can transfer that wish to the Zephilia roots. I can't, Kirito rejected. I don't know how to use such high-level sacred arts. The voice of the observer, however, didn't budge. The formal arts are nothing but a tool to harness and refine the meaning, what you call a mental image. At this point, you need neither chance nor catalysts. Now wipe your tears and get to your feet. Feel the prayer of the flowers, feel the ways of the world. As the mysterious voice went silent, Kirito got up and prayed for the flowers, asking for their help. And just like the mysterious voice suggested, the flowers, no, the world responded to this prayer of a dream. One thing cut from the anime, however, was that Kirito thanked the flowers, the world, and the mysterious voice he heard in his head, and promised to apologize from the branch he cut off of the demon tree and thank it for its mysterious aid during his duel against Volo. When he was going back to the building, he looked above to the sky and saw a light separating itself from the tall Axiom Church Tower. The light closed in on his location and passed him, moving towards the end mountains far far away. It was a dragon mounted by an integrity knight. The lights on the dragon wasn't warning lights, nobody else was flying anyways. It was there to showcase the dragon and the integrity knights as a source of power to gloat over the residents and inject fear onto them. Kirito knew it was one of the ways the Axiom Church was keeping their control, and on top of the tower was where Kirito hoped would end his journey, an admin console and a way out. At the end of March, Sortili and Aserlut defeated Volo Levantine in the graduation duel and was granted access to the Imperial Battle Tournament. Kirito fulfilled his wish of providing her the Zephilia flowers she always wanted to see. Two weeks after, she faced someone from the Norlangarth knighthood in the first round. Eldri Wolfsburg, the person who defeated Liana, proceeded on his path to get access to the Axiom Church Tower. In their next year, Kirito and Yujiro became elite disciples by being ranked 5th and 6th in their year and took Tisa and Ronye as their trainee pages. Just for clarity, her name is really Ronye, not Roni as the official English translation says, Reiki Kawara confirmed that much himself. But yeah, keep an eye out on this scene, both Tisa and Ronye will play a huge role as we move on to the contents of volume 11, Alicization Turning. And you can trust the title of the book, Alicization Turning is literally where the entire story just turns on its head. We'll spend more time with the resident dicks of the academy, Rayos and Humbert, as Kirito and Yujiro's journey towards the top of the Axiom Church Tower will continue week after week, but a whole lot of unexpected circumstances await them in the process. 
But that brings us to the end of this week's Elicization episode, Swordsman's Pride, wrapping up the contents of Volume 10, Elicization Running. Next week we'll start with Volume 11, Elicization Turning, in Episode 9, Nobleman's Responsibilities. And if you made it this far into the video, please do comment Time for Elicization Turning down in the comments to show that you're actually, that you're actually this far into the video. Thank you. Now it's time for the story to turn on its head and of course get more screen time for the best girl of volume 11, Tisa. I'm sorry, I probably couldn't bring much to the table this week but as I said this was a pretty damn faithful adaptation overall so I had nothing much to add. Maybe I can add some opinions so um, yeah it felt like a little bit too much budget was spent on the light and particle effects so overall the episode was somewhat visually stale reverting to way too many static shots even during some fight scenes and the overabundance of shot reverse shot but I'm not a movie critic nobody cares about these loved the episode 9.5 out of 10 because only I'm a 10 out of 10 would watch again and again and a whole bunch more times because the garden scene emotions was just perfect I still prefer the flower visuals in the opening though as for the giveaway, as I said, I want to celebrate the 20k subscribers on YouTube that I would not be able to achieve without you. Well, quite literally, no subscribers is definitely a number below 20k, so it's time to give back to you guys a little for supporting me so far and hopefully will enjoy my future content as well. So, throughout the runtime of the anime, I will be giving out Sword Art Online Elicization novels depending on the content being adapted by the anime. I'll run these giveaways to ensure you get the book for an upcoming arc about a week before it starts airing. So for the next 15 days at the time of this recording, you can click the link below to join the giveaway. There are multiple ways to join and the more objectives you fulfill, the more chance you will have to be the winner. The current reward is Sword Art Online Volume 12, Elicization Rising and I will announce the winner when we are halfway through Volume 11, Elicization Turning Content in the anime. The next giveaway to follow will be V19, Elicization Dividing, followed by V14, Uniting, etc. If I run out of novels to give, considering, you know, Yampress translation speed, I'll think of something else. But for now, we are running with this idea, so hope you enjoy and good luck. As Yujiya would say, stay cool. As we come to the end, as usual, huge thanks to my patrons for supporting me directly. Hope you enjoyed this video, likes are always appreciated, subscribe for next week, episode 9 explained, and I will see you then. Stay cool.